about a message that made a definite impression on my heart that Brother Dwayne Moore preached here, oh, I don't know, maybe three years ago. So far, so good. Amen. <laughs> and uh, and that's, the, that's the truth, isn't it, brethren? So far, so good. God's been good to us, and I'm thankful for the Lord's goodness. I want to talk to you again tonight about the family and the home, and I want to share with you some scripture that, uh, well, may be a little difficult for some, but uh, we're going to share it nonetheless because it's God's Word, and I want to help you. I think you realize that every time I step behind the pulpit, it's my goal to help you, uh, and sometimes I can help you with encouragement, sometimes I can help you with reproof, but I always want to help you in the way of instruction. And so I pray that as we look at the Scripture tonight that you would understand that the instruction is coming from uh, the man of God as it comes from the Word of God. And I want to talk to you about your family, about the importance of structure, about how important it is to train your children and to spend time with them in spiritual things. I'm afraid that even among Bible-believing Christians, that we've gotten to the place to where we feel like, well, you know, as long as, as long as I just spend an adequate amount of time with my children, then everything is going to work out okay. Well, first of all, I'm glad that parents want to spend time with their children. But I want you to know that just spending time with your children is not going to guarantee that everything is going to work out okay, number one. And then number two, I would hope that your goal for your children would not be just okay. Uh, we seem to have really lowered our standard of what we would like to see God do in the lives of our children, and it almost has gotten to the place to where we feel out like we're, you know, we're just relieved that our children are not doing what the world's doing. Like we count that a victory. Like, you know, well, you know, at least my child's not uh, on drugs. Well, I'm glad your child's not on drugs too, but what are they doing for Jesus, you see? And we need to get back to the place where we begin to train in our children and instill some structure and discipline in their lives. You say, well, you know, I'm here tonight and I don't have any children in the home. Well, if you're a grandparent or even if your children are grown, there's still some things that you can do to influence and impact their life. And so I'd like for you to follow along carefully. Several years ago, I heard a message by Dr. Bill Rice. And it made an impact on my life as a young man who just had small children at the time. I mean, I don't even think all of our children were born at that time. And so it's been several years ago. And so I, I was fumbling through and just going through some notes. I try to keep notes uh, that I've made for years. And, and those notes began to get my mind working and my wheels turning. And I felt the Lord would have me to, to preach it on this line of the importance of training your children by scriptural truths. And so I want to talk to you about that. The Bible uses illustrations. I think it was Harry Ironside that said that every good message ought to have illustrations. And illustrations are windows that kind of let us in or let us see into a biblical truth. There, there's uh, good illustrations that can be given that kind of opens the window up and shines the light on a spiritual truth. Now, uh, no, no message ought to, uh, to be just all illustrations. No, no house would be all windows, right? No, you, you wouldn't want to live in a house all windows, and you wouldn't want to preach a message just using all illustrations. But illustrations are good, and the Bible uses illustrations. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you tonight from the Scripture how that God gives spiritual truths, and He uses the family, and He says, listen, your family is, is going to be able to teach this spiritual truth by the way that you follow what I have outlined in my Word for your family. And so I want you to listen carefully. If you'll take your Bible just for a moment, we've read here, and this is what Paul was saying actually in this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He's saying, you know, you are the proof. You're the proof. We don't need a letter. You know, I, I, don't, need, I don't need somebody writing a letter saying, you know what, God's way must work. And, and here's why, and writing it down. He said, you're the proof. You're the letter. You're the epistle. You show what I preach works. Amen. Well, see, our children need to see that in our lives. They need to see that what God's Word, as it is given and it goes to work in our lives, they need to see God's Word works. But if we're just, listen, if all we're doing is just hearing the Word and we're not practicing the Word, 
then it sends a mixed signal to our children, to our young people. I want you to think about this. Now, listen, I've been pastoring for over 30 years. Brother David mentioned he's been in youth ministry for over 10 years. There's some men sitting in this room. You've been in church probably, uh, I know Dr. Thompson's been in church probably uh, longer than I am old. All right? So there, we've got some experience in this room. And I think that if we men with experience would just think about it for a moment, this would be a conclusion that we come to when it comes to this matter of children. We look at our, our, our society today, in particular our Western society, and even more particular in America. And we look at our young people, and it's disturbing, brethren. It's disturbing. And, and, and we think, you know, it's the children. It's the young people. My, the young people of this day. My, the children of this day. And, and you go into a local store. It could be a Walmart. It could be another department store. And you see the rebellion. And you see the defiance. And you see the disrespect. And you see the, 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 the impure and, and, and the way that, that young people carry themselves. And, and you, you think it's the children. But I'm here to tell you, it's not the children. Amen. It's the parents. Right. See, children haven't changed. Right. Parenting has. Now listen to me. See, we have got to put the problem at the source. And the source is not the children. The children need training. The Bible teaches that it is the place of the parent to train the child. It is not the place of the church to train your children. It is not the place of the Christian school to train your children. It, listen, thank God that we can, we can partner up and we can be a part of that process. But the Bible is very clear in the book of Deuteronomy and other places of the Scripture that it is the place of the parent to parent the child. Say amen with me now. I need a witness. I need you to understand what I'm telling you is from this book. Amen. And we've gotten away from it. And if we're going to see a change in the next generation, then it's going to have to come from the parenting. And I want you to evaluate and ask yourself some hard questions. I mean some difficult questions. Dad, what are you doing to invest spiritual things into the life of your child. You say, well, I'm at church, aren't I? Is that it? Is that it? The Bible says that your responsibility goes far beyond that. We are to take this book and to sit down with our family and to open this book and to teach our family biblical principles. It's the place of the Father. We are the priests of the family. And God is going to hold me and you and every dad under the sound of my voice and every dad that's not under the sound of my voice accountable for our families. Amen. And we can sit back and say, well, it's the, it's the rock and roll crowd, preacher. It's that, it's that old country crowd. It's that Hollywood crowd. It's, that, it's them athletes. It's, those, it's Colin Kaepernick. He won't kneel to the flag. Listen to me. If we will sit down with our children and teach them this book, that won't mean a whole lot. Because they will know what is right and what is wrong. They will know. And they'll act accordingly. But if we, listen, as long as we get caught up in, in, in everything but the right thing, and we expect our children by chance to turn out right, we are headed for heartache. And so I want to help you. I, I, I want you to understand how, the importance of this. We have many young couples in the church and many Many couples in the church that have young children and some children on the way. And we have got to get back to the place where we realize it is our responsibility as parents to train up our child or our children. It's not the nursery's place. It's not the nanny's place. It's not the babysitter's place. It's not the, the Sunday school teacher's place. It's not the bus director's place. It's not the Christian school's place. It's your place, Dad. Mom, listen to me. It's your place. Accept that parental responsibility that God has given you and wear it proudly. Aren't you glad that God's blessed your home with children? Amen. Aren't they a blessing from the Lord? Amen. Amen. Children are a blessing from the Lord. They're the Lord's heritage. It, it's their own loan. God has given us these precious little, little bundles of joy and eternity to mold and to shape their lives. So I want to give you some things I think will help you. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. That's just a few chapters over. And when you, when you look at that, 
Paul was saying this. He's saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Purity. Now, here's something that's missing in our homes today. Purity. I see men and women very flippant about this matter of purity. And I see young people very flippant about it. And the reason they're very flippant about it is because parents are very flippant with it. And we're very flippant with it in a spiritual aspect. And so, because we're very flippant with it in the spiritual aspect, it's going over into the physical aspect of life. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. Now, I want you to look here at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, God means that when he says that. Okay, I want you to understand something. You should never be afraid. I'm not afraid. You, we should never be afraid of separation. Separation is a good thing. God gave separation for a good purpose. See, God knows you. God knows me. God knows what we need. And he said, I don't want you to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In, in, in my 30, almost 35 years of ministry, I have never and I do not plan on advising a young saved person to hook up and yoke up with a young unsaved person. That's wrong. That's wrong. And he said, be ye not unequally yoked. By the way, it's not only wrong in, in, in a relationship, it's wrong in business. It's just wrong. And we've got away from this clear teaching of the Word of God. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, brethren, that's just as clear and simple as it can be. And God still means it. God still means this. We are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And yet, we're seeing today where people are just hobnobbing and running around and yoking up and, you know, uh, uh, attending things with, with the loss. And listen, if your best buddies are lost, there's something wrong with your spiritual life. Listen to me now. If, there's, if your best buddies, if the people you enjoy being around are not born again, serving Jesus, on fire for God, you're headed for trouble. Because evil communication corrupt good manners. You see, you are, you are either like or going to become like the people you spend your time with, and so am I. Be careful who you spend your time with. There was a day... When Bible believers, listen, they held to this truth. I mean, listen, it was a cardinal truth in the Word of God. And now people just become very loose and flippant, uncaring, unconcerned. And because of it, we're seeing a lot of immorality in our churches and among our, our Christian schools and, and, and among our young people. Why? Because when we do not take this principle here that God has given... In the, in the physical realm, it's going to affect our spiritual. See, here is a physical truth that God has given. And he said, I want you to understand that you need to stay away from unbelievers. Amen. You need to stay away. Listen, I don't mean don't witness to them. I don't mean don't love them. You know and I know we have out, we want to win them to Jesus. We want to do everything we can. And sometimes from a distance, we want to befriend them. But if you are spending all of your time with people who do not know Christ as their Savior, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your approach to life. And I'm just going to go a step further than that. I am, I am just absolutely, I, I cannot comprehend how people these days can, can get with people who say they're Christians, living in open sin, and they're their buddy. They want to spend time with them. They want to, uh, uh, on social media, want to lie. Hey, I'm going out to commit adultery. Well, have fun. Hey, what do you mean have fun? What do you mean have fun? You mean get right, don't you? Amen. I tell you right now, we are, listen, we're messing up. 
We're sending signals to our young people that sin's okay. And I told you this morning, I'm going to tell you again tonight, sin is never okay with God. Amen. Never. Amen. Never. It doesn't matter if you're practicing it. It doesn't matter if I'm practicing it. It doesn't matter who's practicing it. Sin is never okay with God. Amen. Never. So what happens when we do these things? Purity. Well, I think you and I both know that in the Ten Commandments, and I want you to listen carefully, in the Ten Commandments, God said, I don't want you getting around and, and, and yoking up unequally with those unbelievers and they're your best friends and you're going to their places and you're doing their kind of things. Hey, before long, you're going to find yourself backslid on God. You do understand that. Somebody help me out here. You do understand that. That you cannot fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You cannot be a part of the things that the world does and still be what you need to be with Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. The Bible says in Exodus chapter number 20, as God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments, he, he said this. And I want you to listen. He said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what he said. Now, I realize that, you know, you, you, you can just about watch any program on television today and you've got adultery. That's why you ought to quit watching it. Adultery. Listen, you ought not be sitting around watching people commit adultery. Say amen with me now. Say, hey, man, that stuff is trash. You allow your children to watch that stuff and expect them to turn out right. How can you do that? What's wrong with that thinking? What's wrong with that thinking, brethren? Adultery. It's sin. God said don't do it. It's wrong. Do you know that God has attached plagues and diseases and shame and guilt and curse on that sin? God hates adultery. God hates putting away. Listen to me. And yet we become okay with it. We're, we're even congratulating people. Well, I tell you, we're sending some mixed signals to our young people. And when our young people begin to want to experiment with it and, play, and, and, and get involved in it, and we say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. We're sending mixed signals. We're not taking a stand against sin anymore, and we're not calling sin, sin. Listen, you, you don't have to hate sinners, but you can hate sin. Right. Amen. 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 Preacher, what's that got to do with anything? I'm going to show you. How many of you believe Exodus 20, verse number 14 says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Raise your hand. If you believe adultery is wrong, raise your hand. I'm looking because I want to see. I want to see who thinks adultery is wrong. We got some folks in here who, who either is not listening or don't think adultery is wrong. If you don't think adultery is wrong, there's something bad wrong with you. It's wrong. Now, why, why did God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Why, why should we really enforce that, practice it? I'm going to tell you why. James 4.4. 4. Notice if you would in James 4.4. 4, what God said. God said, I don't like this thing called adultery. And I don't want you doing it. I want you staying away from it. I want you teaching your young people that there's a plague, that there's disease, that there's a curse placed on that sin. Amen. Now why, God? He said, because it's going to affect you. When you get loose, when you get loose in that area, notice what James chapter 4 and verse number 4 says. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now I didn't write that, God did, but I believe it. I believe it, brethren. Now what's happening? We've quit teaching our children that, that to practice sin, to get involved in sin, that, that God judges sin. And God's not pleased and God's going to hold us accountable for sin. And so here, he said, you know what? There is a physical adultery, but he said, you know what? There's a spiritual adultery too. And so we wonder, why, why do people go to these rock churches? Why would somebody want to go to church where they do the rock and roll thing and some guy sits up on a stool and sits back and gives a 10-minute lesson and call that church? I'll tell you why. Because we've gotten loose with Exodus 2014. 
And so therefore, spiritual adultery means nothing to us anymore. That's why. Why are our churches dying and, and people think it's nothing to go and, and go to a concert and call that church? I'm going to tell you something. That's not a church service. That's not church. A man of God won't stand up and preach this book. You ain't been to church. That's bad grammar. It's good theology. I'm going to tell you something, brethren. We're messing up. And when we, when we loosen up and lighten up with our morals and with purity with our young people, and we don't teach our young people, you need to stay chaste and clean. And I didn't say our girls. I said our young people. Boys and girls, you need to teach your children. You stay chaste. You stay pure. You stay clean. You save yourself for the, for the honeymoon night. Amen. Say amen with me now. Ah, oh, preacher, that's old-fashioned. Yeah, I know, I'm old-fashioned. This book's old-fashioned. We need to get back to teaching our young people some things. Well, we decided to kind of let them come to that decision on their own. You've made a bad decision. See, children have to be taught these things, brethren. They have to be taught these things. Do you know, now think about this for a moment, and then I'm going to move on to another point. I'm talking to you about purity. We've gotten away from teaching that purity is God's way. It's almost like the world's intimidated us. I'm not going to let the, the world intimidate me by the grace of God. I want to stay true to what this book teaches and, I, and preach, and I believe you do too. But we're going to have to stay focused. See, there, there are people that if I were to, to come up from the, to the pulpit tonight and say, hey, look, folks, I got, I, I've got a, a, an announcement. Today. And I heard old, old Bill Rice say this many years ago, and I thought, is he serious? He said, I've got three wives. If I were to get up and say that tonight, I would hope that all of you would get up and walk out. I'm serious. If I stood up before you tonight and said, hey, I just, I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm experimenting. <laughs> you know, I, I love my first wife, but I thought I'd get me a couple of more, so I've got three wives. If you sit and listen to me preach, there's something wrong with you. Say amen with me. And yet, when it comes to this thing of friendship with the world, we, we don't seem like that bothers us too much. When it comes to spiritual adultery, it doesn't seem to really jolt us much. When it comes with hooking up with the world and friendship with the world and acting like the world and dressing like the world and listening to the world's music, going to the world's places, it doesn't seem to, to bother us that much. But you let somebody in the church that's a teacher or a deacon and, and uh, uh, the preacher or on the pastoral staff, you let them get them two wives at the house, and I guarantee you, boy, that's going to get somebody's attention. Right? You see how God connects these things? He said, look, if you're going to be pure in one, you've got to be pure in another. And you won't be pure in one if you're not pure in the other. You'll let your guard down. You'll start accepting things, and, and things will start, uh, you know, slipping in, and, and you'll start backing off. And brethren, we just don't want to do that. We want to stay compassionate, but we want to maintain our convictions. You can do both. Amen. Amen. Purity, it's important, brethren. Teach your children purity. Over the years, as I was training my children, I do it today because there's young people watching me. You're not going to see me hugging and, 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 and giving sugar to other women. What in the world? Listen, listen. My wife's down here and she said, no, you're not. <laughs> hey, man. What, what, what's going on? See, we, we teach our children, we teach them by having morals and having guidelines and having, uh, you know, just, just things that you, they're just things you should do and things you shouldn't. Are you teaching your children that? Hey, don't be putting your arm on that girl. That's not your wife. Keep your hands off of her. Don't be putting your hands on that boy. That's not your husband. You keep your hands off of him. But we're dating, preacher. I don't care what you're doing. You're getting ready to mess up. Parents, teach your children guidelines. 
Teach them there's things you do and things you don't do. Purity, chastity, it's important. It's important. I want you to take your Bible now just for a moment. I want you to turn over to Galatians chapter number 6. While you're turning there, can I tell you that it seems like a lot of Christians today, and, and, and I don't mean here at Fellowship, but listen, if we're not careful, it can happen to us. It, it, you seem like you, a lot of folks want to have one, world, one arm around the world and one arm around the church. Have you noticed that lately? You know, can I tell you that the Bible says this? Now, I want you to listen. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. If any man have the love of the world in him, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can tell yourself all you want to that you love God, but if you love the world, you don't love God. As a matter of fact, if you love the world, you're, in, you're at enmity with God. That's what the Bible says. You're no friend of God if you love the world. That's what the Bible says, brethren. So be careful. Be careful. Well, preacher, I just like, I just like all, all this thing, you know, all the, the lights and the glamour and, and, and boy, that, all the things that the world has to offer. Well, the flesh, is, listen, those things are appealing but we, listen, we crucify the flesh. We die daily. We stay focused on what God wants us to be and not what we want to be, right? Separation, consecration, dedication. Stay focused. Purity is important. Isn't it? Teach your children purity. Dad, you ought to call your young sons in and tell them, don't be touching no girls, boy. Don't you be doing that. I see you touching them little girls, man, you're going to have a talk. And you're not going to lie at the end of, of, of the talk. Amen. Mamas ought to call little girls and have a talk with them. Don't you, listen, don't you be touching no boys and don't you let no little boys be touching you. Amen. Amen. You say, preacher, where is this coming from? From this book right here. Right. Somebody, needs to start, somebody needs to start reminding us parents that we have a responsibility to teach our children some things. Well, you know, preacher, I got a few hairs on my chin now. I think I'm going to touch her. You keep your hands off of her. You don't touch her, put a ring on her finger. Amen. Amen. You're messing up. The Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Now, what it says? Yeah. Be careful. Be careful. I'm seeing a lot of looseness in this day, and it's going to end up coming back to bite somebody, and I don't want to see it happen. I don't want to see it happen. Men, y'all never be alone with a lady in case she's your wife. Amen. Ladies, y'all not ever be alone with a man. Never. You go visiting, y'all go two by two. And if you're by yourself, you should never go in the house. Never. Here, here at the church, many of you know this. For those of you that are guests, then this will be news to you. But the people that are here at the church, we never allow a person to be in a room with any children alone. Never. That's a policy we have here. You say, I think I saw someone in the, in, in, in the room with a child alone. You need to let me know who that was and when it was. I'm going to address that. We do not allow anyone to be alone with children for not only for the sake and the safety of the child, but for that adult as well. A lot going on in our world today, and we need to keep ourselves above board, and we need to keep ourselves clean and our, without repute. Amen? We need to remain in a way that would preserve a good testimony. It's just the thing to do. Purity. It seems like we've gotten away from it, and it seems like we've gotten a little loose, and if we're not careful, and I mean it's a society now, and it's gotten into the church, and we've let our guard down. Messing up. Messing up. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right? All right. Galatians chapter 6. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Isn't that what the Bible says? I want to talk to you in the time remaining now, and I'm not going to finish this message, but that's okay. This is a two-pointer, maybe a three-pointer. All right? Or a parter message. Galatians 6. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Look at verse 7. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. See, God has a sowing and reaping process. And God says, I am going to judge sin in your life. I want you to listen to me carefully. It seems like we've gotten in a day to where we've got, well, God won't require it. I'm here to tell you God is going to require it, brethren. Now he is. And I want to save somebody. 
I want to save somebody some hardship tonight. I want to save you some sorrow and some heartache. God has said that he's going to judge sin. He has always judged sin. He is judging sin, and he's always going to. All right? You need to teach your children that there is judgment for wrongdoing. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to me. When our children were smaller, I taught our children, if you sin, you're going to answer to God for it. If you disobey, you're going to answer to me for it. All right? You do wrong, you're going to answer to somebody. You cannot do wrong and get by. You need to let your children know. Now, here's a problem that we're having in our society today, and it's not with the children. It's with the parents. I don't know who, who in this congregation has been in church, been a pastor, uh, evangelist, youth worker, but I believe that I could ask everyone that's been in church here for a good while and has watched, they would come right up and stand right here in this place and testify to you what I'm getting ready to say. A lot of young people are not where they need to be with the Lord. Not because of the church, not because of the Christian school, not because of the youth program, but because of their home. Amen. We have parents today who don't take parenting serious. They don't take it serious. They don't understand the importance of instilling principles and biblical truths into the lives of their children. It's important. It's more important than working that overtime. That you get home and spend, your, spend some time instilling some scriptural, biblical truth into the lives of your children. It's more important than that girls' party that you're going to go to, that you stay there and be a mom and teach your children some things that they need to know about God and serving the Lord. It's important. Seems like we're living in the me generation, doesn't it? Everything's got to be about me. A selfie for me. A, a, a this, a that. It's all got to be about us. As a parent, we need to make it about our children, brethren. We need to invest into their lives. And I want to save you some problems here, okay? Listen to me. Judgment. I wonder if you tell your children to do something right now if they'd do it. If they wouldn't, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. When I'm out in the stores and you see this too, and it's not, listen, it's not just people outside of the church. It's in our churches today. Parents telling children three, four, five, eight, ten times to do something, still hadn't done it. Still hadn't done it. You know why? No training. No judgment. I remember one time I was out visiting, and there was, a, there was an elderly lady, and she had her grandson there, mean as a snake. I mean, that little fellow running around, I mean, he was just running around, ah, screaming, and I'm thinking, you know, would you please hush that kid up? I couldn't even think straight. And so he walked over there, and I was trying to talk to her, and, and, and she was having surgery, as I recall, and and, and I was trying to talk to her about her surgery coming up, and that was her grandson. She was keeping her grandson for her, her uh, daughter. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> so he walked over there, and, and, and she said, whatever, you know, Billy, why don't you sit down? The preacher, uh, uh, he can't think. He, he's trying to talk. And he ran over there, and he got the front door, and he opened it up, and he went, no, pow, and slammed that door. And I thought, oh, 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 oh. She looked at me and said, what do you do, preacher? I said, would you really like to know? I'm serious. I said, would you really like to know? She said, yeah. I said, well, I can only tell you this. When I was that little boy's age right there, had I done what he'd just done, my mama would have gave me something that I would have gone out of the door slamming business for the rest of my life. I wouldn't even wanted to walk through a door. I wouldn't even wanted to shut it behind me. You know what I'm talking about? There was a day when that just wouldn't do. You know why? Because we knew that judgment was going to be swift and sure and consistent. You know what's happening today? Billy! Billy, I'm not going to tell you again. Billy, don't you touch that. Oh, Billy, I'm going to call your dad. 
Bob, come and do something with Billy. One, two, don't make me say it. Oh, come on. We're laughing, but we ought to be weeping. Because it's going on, brethren. You say, what's the big deal, preacher? I want you to, I want you to turn in your Bible as I bring this to a close. There's so much. Listen, if we could just get a hold of the responsibility that God has given us as parents and grandparents, brethren, God wants us to mold little servants of Jesus, not little friends of the world, not little rebels, little soldiers of Jesus Christ. And it's not going to happen without investing time and effort. I think you would have to agree with that. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs. And there's many scriptures in the Proverbs. Turn, first of all, if you would, to Proverbs. Look at verse number, chapter 13. Would you turn there? Proverbs chapter number 13. I'm just going to read some of these, and then I'll make a statement, and we'll close tonight. Look, I want to help you. I... I I don't want you to do like I've seen so many others. Listen, as I said, I, I've been in this 30, almost 35 years. I've seen parents, they've come to me weeping. I don't know where my son is tonight. Little Billy that slammed the door is now 16 years old. He's, he, he's been in and out of penitentiaries and juvenile delinquent uh, homes, and, and he's on drugs. And, he, and, and, and when mom tells him, Billy, Billy, uh, uh, Come in here preaching. Pastor Freeman's gonna, he's gonna talk about the results of sin. And if you don't get saved, Billy, you're gonna die and go to hell. You know what Billy does? Ha <laughs> Yeah, that's what you said when you threatened to whip me when I slammed that door, you never did it, and God's not gonna do it too. I have no respect for authority, I have no respect for 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 any kind of uh, of, of what's right or, or who's in control. I'm gonna do what I want to do, right? Isn't that what it's about today, brethren? You know why? Because we have inoculated a generation to believe that what God says, what authority says, what dad says, what the preacher says is just a bunch of threats. But it's not real. So the next time you go to say, I'm not going to tell you again, you think about that before you tell them again. Because there's going to be a day they're going to come to you and say, hey, I'm broken and I, I don't know what to do. And you say, well, now God says, well, God will let me by. Dad did. God will. God won't hold me to it. Dad didn't. Mom didn't. God won't. Right, brethren? Yes. Yes. Proverbs, are you there? Are you there? Turn if you, you would. I think I said... Proverbs chapter 13. Look at verse 24. And I just want to read some of these scriptures. Look, the book of Proverbs is filled with this teaching. We're living in a day where people say, well, you know, preacher, you can't whip your children anymore. DSS will get involved. They'll just have to get involved. Preacher, you're about crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm hooked up to the right source, brethren. I'm not going to let somebody from, from, from down the road tell me how to run my home. There's a God in heaven. I want to exercise wisdom, prudence, caution. I don't want to be a rebel of my own, but I'm not going to be letting people tell me now how to, how to run the home that God's made me responsible for, and I don't advise you to do that either. Amen. Proverbs chapter 13. Look, if you would, in verse number 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Well, that's kind of the exact opposite of what people say in the day, isn't it? Well, I just love him so much, you know. I just can't bring myself to do it, preacher. I just, I just can't. I mean, I know they need it. I got it when I was younger. But, well, you know, I got, I got abused when I was younger. You know, I just don't know, you know. Hey, listen, I, I understand there's a difference between abuse and discipline, but I also understand there is abuse, and I'm not in any way advocating abuse here. 
As a matter of fact, I pinned down, and I'm going to go over it next week, the Lord willing. I'm going to go over the difference. I have it pinned down right here, but for sake of time, I'll do it next week. The difference between abuse and discipline, and there is a difference. And you need to stay on the discipline side. Say amen with me now. Say that loud and clear. Amen. I would never be for you. Listen, I would come to you. I ever see you dis, uh, abusing any child. I'm going to come to you in love and tell you, hey, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about good, straight, strong, biblical discipline and reproof and correction and instruction. Proverbs 13, verse 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now that, listen, that, I think that's pretty clear. So don't tell me, well, we're not going to whip, we're not going to whip them. We're going to call time out. God didn't say he that spared time out. He said he that spareth the rod. You either believe the Bible or you don't. Don't raise your children thinking God's going to be light on sin now. You say, well, we're going to be light on them. Well, listen, God's not like you. He's not going to be light on it. God's not light on sin, brethren. Hear me now. God is a gracious God. We thank God for it. Amen? But God is not light on sin. He's not. So now don't, don't, don't confuse your children with, with, with the way you do things and think, well, I'm going to be light on it. Well, God's not. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes, early and often. I'm telling you what the book says, brethren. This book is not, right. uh, it's not wrong. It's, it's always right. That's my saying. The Bible is always right. Turn, if you would, just for a moment over to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19. And I'm just going to hit a few of these, and then we'll, we'll finish up. All right. Proverbs 19. I'm just going to read them. I won't comment too much on it. Proverbs 19. Look at verse number 18. Chasten thy son without, while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his cry. Chasten him while there's hope. I'm afraid that some folks are waiting, like old Dr. Bob said, some folks are waiting uh, about 16 years and 200 pounds too late. Somebody say amen with me. About 16 years and 200 pounds too late. You better start where they're young to teach them to respect the authority and that there's swift judgment coming for disobedience and defiance. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, turn to it. Proverbs 22, look at verse number 15. We all know verse 6 in there, and we'll come back to that in another message that I'm working on. But in Proverbs 22, verse number 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. I don't know that I've ever seen a day where there's just so much foolishness going on. Foolishness. When I hear statements like this, it lets me know you know, there, there seems to be this thing going around on social media. You know, uh, you've never heard your dad whip a belt out of his pants and it shows. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? I'm afraid there's some folks who've never heard dad whip his belt out and say, all right, line up. Oh, preacher, I would never do that. It shows. You're talking to a fellow who's, who's had to walk a block to pick a keen switch and then bring it back just so it could be used on him. You say, well, this is because it happened to you. That don't mean it should happen to everybody. Would to God it would. I'm going to tell you right now to teach you how to walk a straight line. Say amen with me. Oh, preacher, that's abuse. Yeah, you keep on saying that while our young people are popping pills and, and going to guidance counselors and... Uh, Involved in illicit immorality and thievery and all kinds of, listen, indecent behavior. You keep on telling yourself that. Look at Proverbs 29, verse number 15. The rod and reproof. So you sound like one of them guys that believes everybody ought to get a whipping for everything. Well, not necessarily. I believe there's a time for reproof. The Bible teaches that. And I also believe there's a time for correction and a time for instruction. I just don't have time to get all that in in the time we have tonight. But we're going to go there too. I believe there's a time. Listen, I don't even think you should whip your child if you haven't instructed him. If you haven't told your child what's wrong, why would you hold him accountable for doing it? 
You're going to practice correction, give instruction. Say amen with me now. If you're not around long enough to give them instruction, don't come around to give them correction. You're going to put bitterness in their heart and resentment. The Bible says right here in Proverbs 29 and verse number 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bring his mother to shame. Skip on down to verse 17. Correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. Boy, I tell you, there's some mothers that I'd like to just take to the side and just say, I'd like for you to memorize this verse of Scripture right here. Worn out. I mean, just worn to a frazzle. You know why? Chasing their kids around, telling them 20 times to do the same thing. 20 times. I know folks have dogs trained better than that. And I'm not being mean. Sit. Boy, that dog will sit. Johnny, sit down. Now, Johnny, sit down. I said, sit down, Johnny. Dog comes in the house. Stay. What in the world? We're training our animals. We can't even train our children. The Bible says in verse 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest, yea, and he shall give the light unto thy soul. I'm going to close with this one. Proverbs 23. This will be the final one. Turn there if you would. Say, preacher, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let's let, let's let God tell us in Proverbs 23. Look, if you would, in verse number 13. Proverbs 23, verse 13, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. So I don't believe that. Well, I do. There was a day when children got whippings. Then a bunch of liberals who never had children got in office and said, you can't whip your children anymore. And we let them tell us what to do. Not telling me what to do. By the grace of God, I'm going to follow that book, brother. Now, you have a choice to make between you and God. But I'm telling you, there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. You need to teach your children purity. You need to teach them how to be pure and to stay pure how to stay true to God and His Word. Don't yoke up with the world. Don't yoke up with unbelievers. Listen, have compassion. Win them to Jesus. You know I'm for that. You know I'm for that. We're for that. The Bible's for that. I'm for what the Bible's for. But your best friends ought not be lost. Get you some Christian friends. You be, listen, your best friends ought not even be backslid. Get you some Christian friends that are served God on fire for Jesus so they can rub off on you. Amen. 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 Jonathan Edwards was saved when he was eight. You know who Jonathan Edwards was? Saved when he was eight years old. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, saved when he was 12. Matthew Henry, saved when he was 11. Polycock, a Christian martyr, saved when he was nine. See, when you instill some of these principles, it teaches children to fear and reverence God, authority, to have respect and honor for what is good and what is right. But when we just let them go and leave them to themselves, well, we're seeing the result. I don't want that to happen in your home, and I don't want it to happen in, in the homes of the people of the church. Good folks, listen, you know I love you, and I care about you, and I really do want what's best for you and your family. I love these little children, and it would just break my heart to see some of the little children that run around here and play 10 years from now because of inadequate training and no control and no instruction and not instilling biblical principles in the home and teaching them and sitting them down and talking with them about what God can do and will do in their lives. And they're out in the world living for, for the devil and self and they're, they're just messing their lives up. Now, I know you don't want to see that and I don't want to see that, but if we don't, we're going to do it God's way. All right? Let's stand to our feet. There's much more. We'll talk about next week. We'll talk about discipline. You say, well, I thought you talked about that tonight. Oh, no. No, we talked about judgment. Purity. What about it, folks? Wouldn't it be something if everybody started disciplining their children again? Did you know the Bible says that God disciplines every one of his children? Did you know the Bible says that? God disciplines every one of his children. Every one of them. 
What would it be like if every father disciplined his children? Could you imagine? As a matter of fact, if you'll read that scripture in, in Hebrews, first, first century Christianity, there's a lot of people disciplining their children. We've come a long way. We have. Now we've got children disciplining their parents. What about in your home? What's your mindset about this? Are you for disciplining your children? Again, I want to make this very clear. I'm not for abuse. If a person ever took their hand and slapped their child in the face, I'd either have to walk away or fight them. <laughs> I'm not for that kind of stuff. So don't you leave here thinking, man, that guy, he's, what's, what's gotten into the preacher? No, no, you, don't, don't you mistake what I preached here tonight. I am for good, sound, biblical discipline, correction, instruction, consistent. Be consistent. Don't leave here tonight and go home and say, all right, that's it. Every, you know, and your child just moves. I said sit down and just, you know, get all over them. Then tomorrow anything goes. <laughs> See, that's not real. And you'll do more harm than good if you do that now. You will. Don't go home and shoot the TV. And then tomorrow, go and draw money out of savings and buy another one. Don't act on whim and emotion. You let God speak to your heart. And you look over these scriptures and you let God do a work in your life so that when you do something, you're doing it because God said so. All right? Let's bow our heads together. I'm going to ask the pianist to come.